Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs, et bienvenue à l'Université d'Ottawa, Faculté de droit. Je m'appelle John Packer, je suis le directeur ici dans le Centre d'enseignement et de recherche de droit de la personne. Uh, my name is John Packer. I'm director of the Human Rights Research and Education Center here at the University of Ottawa. It's uh, our great pleasure to uh, host this event this evening and to welcome you. Uh, it's uh, my task, aside from uh, expressing our, uh, some words of welcome, uh, also to uh, advise a couple words of uh, order. So if I might just invite you to turn off your mobile phones, if they are on. I think that we all forget to do that. <laughs> so that uh, we won't interrupt the speaker. Um, also, uh, to let you know that um, uh, uh, our uh, speaker will uh, not only make an address, but will, of course, entertain questions at the end of uh, his address. Uh, it now uh, falls to me to invite uh, our uh, a collaborator from the uh, uh, Harvard Club of Ottawa and, uh, and from many other associations, uh, Margaret Huber, uh, to uh, give the introduction of our guest speaker. Uh, Margaret, please. Thank you, John, and thank you for arranging for us today such a fabulous venue. And uh, we're really delighted to be here. Uh, je suis vraiment ravi que nous sommes si nombreux ce soir. Uh, and I'm especially glad uh, that there are so many young people in the audience, students, young professionals, since the Harvard Club uh, and also another organization that I'm affiliated with, the Canadian International Council's National Capital Branch, we really believe that a major part of our mission is to reach out to youth. And uh, I know uh, that uh, this work is so important and really delighted that you're here to share this evening with us. So, Alberto Mora, as you know, a former top lawyer in the U.S. Navy, former Foreign Service officer. We were both fellows uh, together in 2014 in Harvard's Advanced Leadership Initiative. And, you know, he's such a low-key, modest guy it was uh, only uh, into this intense full year program that I learned what a man of integrity and accomplishment he truly is. It was only during a visit to the Kennedy Memorial Library in Boston where he provided a luncheon address to our group about the background to his 2006 John F. Kennedy Profile in Courage Award, did I come to truly appreciate the depth, his depth, and his service to all of us. His values fostered by his mother, whose family had fled communist repression in Hungary, his father, a Harvard-trained doctor who had fled repression in Castro's Cuba. Alberto's conviction that human rights are incompatible with cruelty, that respect for the dignity of the individual is the foundation of the state is a message to us all. His campaign against the use of torture, against institutionalized cruelty, has deep resonance everywhere, including in Canada, where cruel practices can be seen. In our First Nations residential schools historical record, in the so-called 60s scoop, or as recently illustrated in the media through cruelty in some of our military training practices, or within prized institutions like 
our RCMP. Contrary to the values to which we all aspire. As Alberto has pointed out, torture, cruelty undermines social values, undermines respect at all levels for how we are governed. Recently, a friend from cattle country in Alberta critiqued someone as being big hat, no cattle. By that measure, Alberto Mora needs no hat, but is followed by a growing herd of we who are convinced. But let's hear directly from Alberto. Thank you. John Packer, thank you, and Margaret, thank you for the, the wonderful introduction. Um, I'll remember the cattle bit for, for some time. Um, you know, I think many of us have benefited from Harvard. I know I, know I have. I'm a kind of recent uh, uh, fellow f with, with attachments to the school, but um, as Margaret indicated, we were fellows together um, three years ago for an entire year. And um, it's, uh, I just want you to know that one of the great benefits of my association with, with Harvard has been, been to get to know Margaret, um, to learn from her about foreign policy, um, given her distinguished record as a, as a foreign service officer in the Canadian um, uh, foreign ministry, and to be her friend. And I'm here be, uh, out of friendship for Margaret and um, uh, grateful for the invitation to be here before you. Um, I want to talk to you about the Bush administration's use of torture um, as a weapon of war. And um, I'll start with my own involvement so you get a sense of why I got involved in this issue at all uh, and continue to be involved in the, in, in the issue. Now, although I was not part of the initial decision to use torture, uh, I learned of it relatively early on. And it um, uh, is torture, but what the Bush administration called it was enhanced interrogation techniques or counter-resistance interrogation techniques, and the use of euphemisms was consistent during the entire administration. So I, the decision was taken in, um, in the summer of 2002 to use it, and I got, uh, became aware of it then in, in late 2002. Um, and although the, the Bush administration abandoned the use of torture before the end of the administration, in fact, and President Obama formally outlawed it in the second day in office, the allure of torture is still very much uh, with us, and by us I mean the, with the United States. Um, like a low-grade fever that threatens to erupt every so often, the benefits uh, of the use of torture and the issue of whether to return to the use of torture continues to be a subject of discussion and debate in the United States ever since the attacks on 9-11. And as many of you know, it's a very much of controversy uh, in the Bush administration. President Trump has repeatedly declared himself to be a supporter of torture, both during the electoral campaign and after his inauguration. And sadly, he is not an American oddity or outlier in this respect. Recent polling indicates that more than 62% of the American public supports the use of torture. Also, Every one of the Republican candidates for president in the recent election cycle, with the honorable exception of Senator Lindsey Graham, either openly supported torture or refused to condemn it. It's really the same thing. My sense is, is that if President Trump serves out his entire term, and the events in the last week makes this a very large if, uh, given the appointment of a, of a special counsel to look into the relationship with Russia, my sense is that he will openly or secretly attempt to reinstate torture, most likely after the next terrorist attack. Most of us, when we think of torture, think of it or, or view it through a moral and cinematic frame. We tend to think of it at episodically. We recall the scenes of torture that we've seen in movies or televisions and apply our moral judgment to it. But the Bush administration's to, decision to use torture had implications that went well beyond uh, 
these two factors in any government's decision to use torture has policy and systemic implications that go well beyond what happens in a single torture chamber. Note that the US norm against torture originated with George Washington even before the triumph of the American Revolution. And the legal prohibition traces its roots to the British prohibition of torture in 1640 or thereabouts. By 2002, when the US torture policy was adopted, these norms and laws had been deeply and broadly embedded in US policy and practices. Thus, when the US adopted and implemented its torture policy, the decision came to have implications, adverse implications, not only for morality and law, but also for US values in the American character, the rule of law, our constitutional order, the architecture of human rights and our security strategy, our military alliance structure, combat operations, intelligence relationships, and the war on terror itself. Torture damaged the professional norms of doctors, psychologists, and lawyers. It distorted congressional oversight of the executive branch and compromised judicial independence. As an example of how it affected US policy, in one way or another, torture harmed our relationship with probably every democratic country, including Canada. In his work, Algerian Chronicles, Albert Camus, reflecting in part on French torture in Algeria, noted that countries at war need to take care that they not use weapons that would destroy what they're trying to protect. Torture is such a weapon, and the US experience with it demonstrates the wisdom of Camus' insights. I'll touch on some of these factors in a moment, but first let me take you back to how I got involved in the torture issue. In the US, um, the Navy General Counsel is a chief legal officer of the Department of the Navy, which includes both the Navy and the Marine Corps. Uh, he reports directly to the Secretary of the Navy. And the two of us, along with the Under Secretary and four Assistant Secretaries, constitute the seven individuals who are appointed by the President, confirmed by the Senate, and represent the uh, embodiment of civilian control of the military as, um, as contained in the US Constitution. Um, on the legal side, I work very closely with the Judge Advocate Generals of both the uh, Navy and the Marine Corps. Um, and my direct reports included more than 640 civilian attorneys and also included uh, supervision over the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, NCIS. You may have seen the television shows for both JAG and for, uh, for NCIS. The reality, I assure you, is not at all like the, the television shows. Um, now, before 9-11, NCIS was already uh, deeply involved in the fight against al-Qaeda. Uh, due in large measure to their involvement in the investigation of the bombing of the USS Cole in Aden Harbor back in, in, in 2000. So when 9-11 happened, NCIS was the only non-FBI uh, outfit invited into the FBI director's morning intelligence briefing uh, regarding the domestic terrorism picture in the United States. And what would happen is that they would come and brief me early in the morning after they returned from the FBI, and then I would roll into the Secretary of the Navy's morning brief on the international uh, terrorism and intelligence uh, briefing from Navy and Marine Corps intelligence. So because NCIS was involved in the fight against terrorism, um, as their supervisor, I became very much involved in the same kind of fight, much more so at least in the average uh, civilian in the, in the Pentagon. In November of 2002, the NCIS director, David Brandt, who was by then a close professional colleague and has become a very close personal friend over the, over the years, took me aside uh, after a meeting on an unrelated issue and in a low voice said, um, listen, we're hearing rumors that the detainees are being abused in Guantanamo. Do you wanna hear more? Um, now the question was cryptic, uh, but the response, my response to him was really instantaneous. Um, in, in my sense as a, as a lawyer, both in the private sector and the government, when you hear those kinds of words, some sort of abuse, then your, your reflex has to be to respond to it automatically, and, and I told him that of course I did. I needed to hear more of what he had to say. Um, he nodded and said he'd be back the following day with his team to give me a brief. Now there are a couple of contextual things to, to bear in mind here. Now the first is that in 2002, neither the Department of the Navy nor I had any official duty or responsibility for detention operations in Guantanamo or anywhere else. The mission of each military department in the United States is to train, organize, and equip combat ready forces and then to furnish them to the combatant commands. Um, and with the exception of the Army Department, 
detection operations and interrogation tactics were operational matters within the purview of the, um, of the operational chain of command and not the military departments. Although Guantanamo was a Navy base, uh, the detention facilities on the base reported to Southern Command, which is one of our combatant commands, not to the Secretary of the Navy. At the moment that Director Brandt asked me his question, uh, I had zero involvement in detention matters, not a single conversation or meeting, and no knowledge of it, any aspect of detainee treatment. Uh, Dave's question was subtly phrased. He was offering me the opportunity to get involved, but also the opportunity to not get involved. Uh, at least before hearing details that would give me actual knowledge of any problem. Uh, it was in a way uh, a courtesy extended from him to, to me, uh, who was then relatively early in our relationship, uh, a somewhat unknown person. He didn't, we had worked together, but he didn't really know how he would react in a highly controversial, highly politicized uh, matter such as this. So ergo the, the phrasing of the question from him. But as I, I mentioned, for me, not getting involved never, never crossed my mind. Uh, Dave came back the following day then with his, a number of his NCIS agents assigned to Guantanamo. Uh, at Guantanamo, the uh, NCIS agents explained during the meeting, there were two interrogation task forces operating at the time, an intelligence task force and a criminal investigative task force. NCIS was assigned to the second, the criminal investigative task force, uh, whose mission was to build prosecutions against uh, these terrorist detainees, either in Article III courts or in military commissions. Um, the agents had not personally witnessed any abuse, um, but Guantanamo was a small place, and they had heard from personnel assigned to the other intelligence task force uh, about the kinds of interrogation tactics that were being used. Then NCIS went snooping. Uh, without authorization, they tapped into the intelligence task force's computers and extracted some interrogation transcripts, one of which they pushed across the table uh, during the meeting uh, to me. The transcript detailed the sexual taunting of an unidentified detainee whom actually years later I would learn was Mohammed al Qatani, the so-called 20th hijacker. He was being taunted by female army personnel who were straddling him and placing women's underwear on, it, on his head. While this does not constitute cruel treatment necessarily, much less torture, it was clearly evidence of abusive and degrading treatment and helped substantiate the, the, CIS, the NCIS concerns. <laughs> Director Brandt and his NCIS colleagues were worried that the phenomenon known as force creep was already at play in Guantanamo. This is the situation common in the history of interrogation where uh, that occurs when, when the use of cruelty is authorized to the interrogators. And in this setting, interrogators tend to ratchet up the level of cruelty, um, thinking that if cruelty is an effective tool, uh, then twice as much cruelty is twice as effective, and, and, and so on. So abuse inevitably segues into cruelty and cruelty into, into torture, using those terms in their technical, legal sense. Uh, Dave Brand closed his, his brief during the meeting by saying that NCIS did not know how many of the detainees had been abusively interrogated, but thought there was a small number of those held in Guantanamo. Also, he said, uh, they had heard that the, that the use of abusive interrogations uh, had been approved at the highest levels, quote unquote, of the Pentagon, but they had not seen any, any paper substantiating um, or corroborating that, that belief. Uh, I was appalled by what NCIS had described because um, any abuse of detainees at Guantanamo was presumptively unlawful. Uh, however, the degree of abuse I had been shown, while unacceptable, was still relatively mild in the scheme of things. Uh, the number of prisoners being abused ap appeared to be low, and my thought at the time, or at the moment, was that this had to be rogue activity uh, by those, those guards in Guantanamo. A nor American service member, I thought, at the time, would purposely authorize the abuse of any American prisoner. Still, my duty was clear. Um, if there was any prisoner abuse in Guantanamo or anywhere else, my duty as Navy General Counsel was to find it and report it and stop it. And I was confident in my ability to do that. As Navy General Counsel, I had considerable authority uh, in, the, in the office and considerable authority uh, over the, the personnel I supervised. The very next day after uh, Dave Brandt's briefing, 
I called the only person I thought might know something about this, and he was the Army General Counsel, Steve Morello. Um, uh, Army had been given what's called executive agent authority by Secretary Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, to coordinate detention operations globally uh, with the authority of the Secretary of Defense. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as a lawyer, you call people because you conduct in, in investigations all the time. And frequently when you call somebody um, and ask them if they know something or other, uh, then the response is always no. So I called Steve uh, and said, look, Steve, I'm hearing rumors that detainees, detainees are being abused in Guantanamo. Do you know anything about this? And to my shock, he said, I know a lot about this. Come on down to my office. His office was directly below mine in the, uh, in the, uh, in, in the Pentagon. You never hear that kind of response um, when you place that kind of phone call. And I almost dropped the phone when, when he said that. Um, the following day, which is now, so if, if the meeting with uh, Brandt was day one and then the call of Morello was day two, this was day three. Um, I went down to meet with, with, uh, with Morello. Um, he pushed across the table um, a copy of a 80 page or so composite memorandum that had been signed by uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld. Um, which was authorizing the use of what was called counter-resistance interrogation techniques against the detainees in, in Guantanamo. Among these techniques were the use of sensory deprivation, uh, detainee-specific phobia techniques, stress positions, and the use of some force. Um, the, to the memo, uh, which had been authored by the Department of Defense General Counsel, Jim Haynes, there was attached, as I mentioned, in a series of other documents, a very bottom document in the stack was a request for the authorization to use these techniques authored by the commander of Guantanamo uh, facility. And then that in turn was supported by a legal memo written by um, the senior uh, military attorney uh, supporting the base commander. She was uh, an army lieutenant colonel, judge advocate general. Um, the uh, memo concluded that the application of all the techniques would be uh, legal and um, the, the memos, the stack of them, further indicated that that memorandum had gone up to Southern Command in Miami, had been approved by uh, the Southcom commander and his legal staff, and then had gone up to the Joint Chiefs of Staff where it had been under review by the Chairman's legal advisor. But the review had not been concluded when Jim Haynes, the DOD General Counsel, took it out of the Joint Staff's purview and then on his own authority um, sent it to Secretary Rumsfeld with a recommendation that he approve the techniques. And then on the cover note of the memorandum, there was indication of Secretary Rumsfeld's approval of the use of the techniques. And then he had written in his own hand down below, I stand at my desk four to six hours a day, why are they limited to, to standing, um, uh, rather I stand at my desk from eight to 10 hours a day, why are they limited to, to standing from four to six hours a day? As a, as a litigator, uh, this is my, my background, a civil litigator, uh, to allow your client to put that kind of note on any kind of document is just per se malpractice. You know, you, you, you never authorize your clients to do this. But then when I saw this, uh, and then in the presence of Morello, I was kind of thumbing through the document quickly to try to get a better sense of this. It was too large to read entirely, much less absorb in that moment. But I was looking for words of limitation. So I was pers pursuing the documents to see some words that would provide to, to this effect. You may apply these techniques, but only until the point that it reaches the level of cruel and human and degrading treatment, at which point you're not to cross that line. Now, if the application of cruel and human and degrading treatment had been uh, provided for in the memorandum, arguably it would have been legal, because that's the Geneva standard, that's the international human rights standard, that's the American statutory and constitutional standard, uh, meaning the prohibition of cruel treatment or punishment to, to individuals. But those words were nowhere in the memorandum. So what you had was a memorandum that, that simply authorized the use of these techniques in an unmodulated fashion. And it didn't take any imagination whatsoever to know that either singly or in combination, any of these techniques could, um, could constitute even, even torture, depending upon how they were applied. So to my mind, this memorandum was a, 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 a loaded gun uh, that could have potentially lethal consequences depending upon how those authorized to engage in the practices interpreted the authorizations. Um, uh, so, um, at that point it didn't occur to me that this was a deliberate act. 
Uh, mind you, this is November 2002. The country had been at war for a year and a half. There was still the daily fear of, of the terrorist attack. Jim Haynes, even more so than all of us, was working 12 to 16 hour days. Um, we don't tend to have inboxes any longer, but if we had inboxes, he would have had a two-foot stack of paper uh, on his desk every every morning to review. Jim was working so hard that literally he would, on occasion, fall asleep at the wheel driving home from the Pentagon back back home. Um, and my my conviction it never occurred to me um, that it was this was anything other than a simple mistake. Jim was overworked, hadn't taken time to read the memorandum closely enough, or if he had, just didn't imagine. Uh, exercise sufficient creative imagination to understand what what the documents would be would be authorizing, and poor Secretary Rumsfeld. Well, he had literally um, uh, he, he knew, or if he thought about it, he knew there would be that no document would come to him without significant legal analysis. And in this case, there had been four layers of attorneys that had reviewed the memorandum. Secretary Rumsfeld was entitled to uh, believe uh, that every document that came before him had been vetted uh, by by highly skilled attorneys and the contents were, were, were legal. So I felt you had two individuals acting in good faith, made a simple mistake. They authorized something that they should not have authorized, but, but it was inadvertent. So I saw this as a problem that would be simple to correct. All you had to do was point out the mistake to, to the lawyer, and he would then act. So the next day, um, so this would be like day four, I was in Jim Haynes' office with a memorandum in, uh, in hand, and I, in turn, then provided him with a memorandum and said, look, this has come in my possession, and I said, Jim, this memo authorizes torture, uh, and he says, no, it doesn't. Uh, and then I spoke for about an hour. He said almost nothing uh, in response, but gave me the courtesy of listening to everything I had to say. I didn't think he had to say anything, and because when I would just simply point out, well, Jim, what is... What does detainee-specific phobia techniques mean? Is it that the, that the rats, the bats, the snakes? Uh, what, is, what does sensory deprivation mean? Is it a locked closet, light, light-proof closet, a soundproof closet for half an hour, or is it a week or a month, or until madness sets in, or a combination of these things? If, you know, just think about it. Of course, of course this could uh, authorize torture, uh, given that there's no words of limitation to the memorandum, and um, just, just imagine what these techniques could, um, could uh, provide. So I spoke for about an hour, but I thought after I'd pointed out the, the, the mistake in legal craftsmanship, just legal drafting, uh, and the lack of, of, of boundaries to the, uh, the authorities, I, I was confident that Jim got it. And he had a very large office. I mean, his office was like from here to the door. And I was confident that by the time I got to the exit door, Jim would be picking up the phone, calling the Secretary of Defense and saying something like, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld, do you remember that memo on interrogation? I think we need to reel that one back in and kind of rethink it. Um, the next day I go um, with my family for Christmas vacation in, uh, in Miami and thinking that the problem had been solved. Until one day, about uh, a few days later, I'm in the pool in my mother's home, dripping wet, when I get a phone call from the Pentagon, and it's Dave Brandt uh, calling. Dave says, uh, remember the matter, Guantanamo? Uh, well, the problem is not solved. The abuse is still going on. And so I'm, I'm sitting there in the kitchen of my mother's uh, home, uh, understanding that this was not a matter of inadvertent draftsmanship or, or legal malpractice of a sort. Um, it was still a mistake to have authorized this, but the mistake was not inadvertent. Uh, people had purposely authorized the application of cruelty to individuals. So I understood then that the challenge to me in, in reversing that kind of policy was of a different order than the, what I had thought, um, thought before. Um, so I returned to the Pentagon and then, then worked harder to try to overturn the policy. The, first of all, I focused on the lawyer, then the, the civilian lawyers who, like me, were political appointees of President Bush, but now I had focused on the military lawyers as well. I briefed every, every judge advocate general. And I should mention that uh, from that moment on, um, First of all, every JAG, every professional military lawyer, all of them um, major generals uh, at the time, all of them saw the legal issues and the policy issues exactly as I did. And from that moment on until really probably today, uh, I and all the military lawyers acted together as a team to try to focus attention in the building to this authorization and to, and to attempt to reverse it. Um, 
So then I also then met with, um, because I wasn't, these conversations weren't producing any visible effect, I, I then broadened this to include some of Rumsfeld's um, senior civilian advisors uh, also. I, I knew that Rumsfeld w did not see me as a peer. I mean, his level of experience and authority was vastly greater than mine, and I had no illusions that he would see me as a, as a, um, as, as, as a peer that could have this kind of conversation with him, but I wanted to reach those who he would recognize as peers and have them send the message to him that this had been a mistake that needs to be reversed. But despite this activity, I wasn't making any progress. Um, and I had not put anything down in writing because uh, in our government, at least, um, and maybe in yours, sometimes you don't put things down in writing when they're so sensitive that you don't, uh, you, you're concerned about the possibility of leaks and you want to try to manage this issue uh, in a way that uh, uh, is, is satisfactory without starting to generate the paperwork. But, but at this point, I could no longer go without writing uh, my thoughts down and documenting my views because I simply wasn't having any, any visible effects. So I, I, I wrote a memorandum uh, addressed to Haynes, and I chose not to criticize Secretary Rumsfeld. In fact, I critiqued, my, my tactic was to criticize the, the hapless lawyer down in Guantanamo, the lieutenant colonel who had gotten the memo completely wrong. From first glance, my, my conviction was that the memo was a, an incompetent piece of legal work. Uh, she had analyzed the, these interrogation techniques through both U.S. and international law and had concluded that it was all, all hunky-dory. Well, that, that wasn't close to being correct, um, although I'll say this, that the legal issues were more subtle than one might think, particularly after the, the president had taken Geneva Conventions off the table and declared that they did not apply uh, to the conflict against Guantanamo. So trying to craft together a legal memo without Geneva in the picture actually proved to be more difficult than one might think. But nonetheless, the, uh, the law was clear. It was, it was crystal clear, and, um, and uh, that was the focus of my memo. So I, I, I predicted not only that this memo authorized potentially criminal acts uh, and, and could lead to torture, but it would also have massive policy repercussions. All of this which would um, affect anybody associated uh, with the decision to apply um, torture to individuals up to and including the President of the United States. Um, and um, I had the memo delivered to Haynes in his office in draft form early in the morning with a note saying that um, I felt uh, constrained and guilty that I had not written something down, but I felt now that it was time to formalize my views on the subject and that I would sign out the memorandum in final form by close of business unless I had reason to do something, not, not to do that. Um, uh, I got a call from Haynes late in the morning, and I asked me, he asked me to come by to see him. Um, and the first words out of his mouth were, I don't know what you're trying to do with this, to me. And I was so keyed up at the moment that I almost went over across the desk uh, and, and at him. But the next words out of his mouth were, surely you must know what impact your words have had on me. And uh, by now it had three meetings with Haynes. I did all, all the talking. He never responded uh, to any of my comments or thoughts or ideas or, or positions. Um, so I said to Jim, Jim, I, you know, I have no idea what, what impact my words have had on you. Um, on the one hand, uh, you might think that everything I said was the gospel truth, or you might think that I was full of shit or something in between, but because you never say anything, um, you know, I, I, I'm really at a loss to know what, what impact my analysis is that he, he started laughing. He says, well, um, um, you'll be happy to hear that Secretary Rumsfeld is thinking about rescinding the authority. And that sounded good. And so I was kind of leaning back, thinking how to respond to that. When he goes, he goes like this, I know, I know. He says, that's not good enough. Let me talk to the Secretary again, and I'll get back to you. By 3 o'clock, he had called me back and said, good news, the Secretary has rescinded the authorities on Guantanamo. And, but he's ordered us to put together a, a working group of all the civilian and military senior lawyers to analyze the legal and policy implications of interrogation and report back to him in a month. That's another story. I won't get into that. Uh, but within a week, um, NCIS had called me, and they said that we can confirm that the uh, detainee abuse in Guantanamo had stopped. So we had the, the assurance from the DOD general counsel, uh, which was good enough for me, and uh, about the, the authority, and then we had uh, the representations from NCIS that had demonstrated its ability to know what was happening in Guantanamo, saying that the abuse had stopped. This was for us and for me a clear victory. Uh, it had taken longer than I had wished, uh, or all those of us involved in this would have wished, but 
finally, the, we had re regained our senses. We had reverted to the traditional American policy, the legal policy, and we were off on the right track. Um, we thought this was a clear win. There's, there's, a, there's a lot more detail on this, but I won't get into that because the story can be actually quite, quite longish in, in, in full version. So those of us in the Pentagon who had taken this position in, in November 2002, January, February 2003, and obtained this result thought that we had stabilized the military policy towards interrogation. And we believed that until Abu Ghraib exploded on our television screens in uh, April 28th, 2004, or about a year and a half after we had undergone these things in the, in the 60 Minutes 2 program. So that program, of course, broadcast the now iconic photographs of the uh, sexual and physical abuse of prisoners in Guantanamo with the leashes and the other, the other kind of stuff. Um, and the ensuing investigations, of course, indicated that what I thought was isolated behavior uh, limited to just a few detainees in Guantanamo was actually a much broader pattern of abuse that uh, had metastasized well beyond the confines of Guantanamo to include military operations in Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere. And what I learned then at the first at, at the uh, at the time was that of course that this policy was not only limited to the military. In fact, it had its origins in the CIA, uh, in the White House, with Department of Justice uh, then uh, approval. And um, what the facts indicated, and now we all know to be, is that this was an archipelago of torture uh, that was deliberately uh, approved by the president, vice president, um, secretary of state, secretary of defense, CIA director, and, and others. In fact, the CIA's enhanced interrogation policies went up to the uh, National Security Council on three separate occasions, and it was approved each of those times. Um, although the de details of the, or the quality of knowledge um, can, can be debated. I, don't, I actually don't think that there was a lot of knowledge among the senior leadership and maybe even including President Bush as to what the interrogation techniques actually, actually provided. So we know that this was, we now know that this story originated with the CIA in the summer of 2002. Um, and at the time the agency had advised the White House that because of legal limits, um, uh, the standard interrogation techniques then available would be inadequate for the task. So the way that the CIA put it was, look, we're capturing these bad guys, but unless we have authority to go beyond existing legal limits, um, then if the detainee refuses to answer questions, we're out of luck. We have no way to uh, compelling the information that is so vital to uh, securing the United States. So what had happened was that the agency, which at the time had zero, zero institutional experience in interrogations, um, there's nobody in the CIA who had seriously interrogated anybody um, in their entire lives. And the architects of the interrogation policy, as we now know, were two um, uh, Air Force psychologists who themselves had never interrogated anybody in their lives, but somehow the, the, the allure of, of torture, the fear and fury we felt at the, at, at the, at the attackers um, was such that it overrode the the real interrogation professionals who had been in law enforcement at the FBI and in the military services and who always said that this is not the way to go, not only because it's illegal and immoral, but because it's really not as effective as uh, non-cruel interrogation techniques that have been proven throughout history to be vastly more effective than torture. That was crowded out in the emotion of the moment and the White House and the administration came to adopt these, uh, these techniques. Um, you know, as we know, also uh, those techniques, as approved, the counter, the uh, enhanced interrogation techniques were actually reverse engineered from uh, North Korean torture techniques that were used against American soldiers in the in the Korean War. So, with the authority in hand, as provided by John Yoo and others at the uh, Department of Justice, um, and with CIA Director George Sennett as the lead manager, uh, the CIA established a program that became known as the Rendition Detention and Interrogation Program (RDI) dozens of victims, some completely innocent of any combatant activity, were tortured in this program, either directly by CIA officers at the so-called black sites around the world, or uh, through um, cooperative third countries, including Syria and Egypt, who applied torture at, at our request. This is the rendition program, part of the RDI uh, program, outsourced torture. Um, and we, as we now know, 
the United States military uh, actually participated in the abuse. And now there were two forms of abuse. Some of the abuse was the officially sanctioned abuse as perpetrated by the CIA and the black sides, but a lot of the abuse was actually informally conducted. So after researching the issue for, for over a year at Harvard, um, what, what is, is clearly the phenomenon here is that the signal that the gloves had, had come off was clearly transmitted throughout the entire military and the enti entire government. And the, 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 the word, informal that, as it may have been, that the, uh, the, the government had authorized the application of harsher interrogation techniques became generally known. Uh, also, the notion that there would be no accountability for, uh, for the use of these techniques was also generally understood uh, in the government. And also, the, the folklorish belief that the use of torture or cruelty is uniquely effective in, um, in producing accurate intelligence rapidly became promulgated. Uh, and infected the military services. So hundreds of individuals became then abused in uh, U.S. Army, primarily U.S. Army um, uh, captivity uh, in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other places ar around the world. So let me turn back to Guantanamo for a second. What happened to al Qatani? So this is the individual who you recall was being sexually taunted by female army guards. So here's, here's how journalist Jane Meyer described his treatment. Katani had been subjected to 160 days of isolation in a pen perpetually flooded with artificial light. He was interrogated on 48 of 50, 54 days for 18 to 20 hours at a stretch. He had been stripped naked, straddled by taunting female guards, forced to wear women's underwear on his head and to put on a bra. Um, he was threatened by dogs, placed on a leash and told that his mother was a whore. He had been subjected to a phony kidnapping, deprived of heat, given large quantities of intravenous liquids without access to a toilet and deprived of sleep for three days. At one point, Katani's heart rate had dropped so precipitately to 35 beats a minute that he required cardiac monitoring. Make no mistake, this is torture. And it was acknowledged as such by the Department of Defense in 2009, one of the first, maybe the only time that it's done so. So, um, and three years ago, at a, at a meeting, um, uh, an attorney's meeting in New York City, Katani's civilian lawyer told me that it was her belief that had not Secretary Rumsfeld had rescinded the in interrogation authorization at the time that he did, Katani would have died after another one or two weeks of such abuse. Uh, she, he has, she, she told me, uh, suffered permanent physical and psychological damage as a result of this uh, treatment. Now, how did the United States come to use torture in the, uh, in the war and why? Clearly the fear and fury we all felt after 9-11 was the critical factors, um, as was the belief that those who belonged to Al-Qaeda had self-selected to opt out of the human race just through their sheer, sheer savagery of, their, of the attack. But the authorization to apply torture rested also on six implicit policy assumptions. By the way, the RDI program never went through a full policy analysis. Uh, the, the Bush White House only asked itself the question, can we do this, which is the legal question. It never asked itself the question, should we do it? Um, uh, Philip Zelikow, who is the, the wonderful chief of staff to the 9-11 uh, task force, was counselor to the State Department 2005-2006, uh, has said that had the, the NSC taken the trouble of asking a couple of junior analysts to put together a memo over the weekend as to the policy reasons why enhanced interrogation should or should not be used, they would have gotten back on a Monday morning uh, a list of 50 reasons why the United States should not engage in the application of torture. But that memo was never never asked, never, never sought, and never provided. So as strange as it may sound, this decision never went through the policy analysis that many other lesser decisions um, usually uh, take. So what are the six reasons? What are the six policy implications? And here, here they are. The first is that torture is uniquely effective in producing information and its use was necessary if the United States was to be protected against further loss of life. Now, this assumption is categorically false. And in fact, the clear failure record of torture during the Bush administration proves this. Despite the folklore that torture is effective in eliciting truthful information rapidly, this was not only not the case, but the use of torture was both counterproductive and distracted uh, from the uh, use of non-brutal interrogation techniques that could have been more effective than enhanced interrogation. 
In December 2008, the Senate Committee um, of the Armed Services concluded in a report entitled Inquiry into the Treatment of, U of Detainees in U.S. Custody, which was issued without dissent by, by both Republicans and Democrats on that committee, that brutal interrogation techniques, quote, damaged our ability to collect uh, accurate intelligence that could save lives, strengthened the hand of the enemy, and compromised our moral authority, end quote. Similarly, in 2015, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence examined the CIA's 20 major claims of success in the RDI program after reviewing the totality of the, um, the, the agency's written documentation uh, and internal documents on the program and concluded in their final report that, as their first conclusion out of 20, the CIA's use of its enhanced interrogation techniques was not an effective means of acquiring intelligence or gathering cooperation from detainees. And two, that the CIA's justification for the use of its enhanced interrogation techniques rested on inaccurate claims of their effectiveness. I should note that in 2005, General Stanley McChrystal, when he was commanding US troops in Iraq, turned down by an offer by President Bush in, uh, to confer on, upon him authority to use enhanced interrogation techniques in the Iraqi theater of operations. But then General McChrystal had seen the data indicating that the units that did not use brutality uh, obtained better intelligence and had better relations with better community and thus better combat records than those units uh, in, uh, in, uh, that, that did use brutality. In fact, the U.S. Army in Iraq conducted a double-blind experiment uh, because some units were using brutality, others were not, and with, when McChrystal, with, ironically, the, the very capable assistance at the time of General Michael Flynn, who was an intelligence head, as this is actually almost shocking given recent, recent developments, but General Flynn was a very able intelligence commander uh, working for McChrystal. And they put the numbers together, they analyzed the data, and uh, the data was clear. And it took McChrystal, he's, he's told me personally, about two years then to scrub the use of, of brutality from the US Army in, in Iraq. But when he did so, the performance of US military increased dramatically and contributed significantly to the success of the surge that would come uh, two years uh, two years later. So when in the Oval Office, not, or not in the Oval Office, but in the White House, when, when Bush turned to McChrystal and out of the blue asked him, General, do you need EIT authorities in, in, in Iraq? And the body language was such that Bush was ready to give it to him and was expecting to say, to hear McChrystal say, yes, General, yes, Mr. President, I need that authority. When McChrystal said, no, no, sir, we're doing well. We don't need that authority. Bush was surprised by the, by the answer and, and did not then pursue the matter matter further. So that was number one, um, uh, the belief that it's uniquely effective. Number two, that no law prohibited the application of cruelty. Thus, the government could direct the use of cruelty as a matter of policy, depending on the dictates of perceived military necessity. So this, too, was absolutely false. Uh, U.S. law in 2002 and before, including the constitutional and constitutional jurisprudence, statutes, and treaties, categorically prohibited the use of, uh, the use of cruelty on captives. The proof of this is absolutely extensive, but the Supreme Court held as such when it proclaimed in its 2006 Hamden decision that the Geneva Conventions actually always applied in the, in the war on terror, and, and thus declared that President Bush's uh, 2001 declaration that Geneva did not apply as invalid. That decision, by the way, dismantled the entire legal architecture for the war on terror, which the Bush administration had put together. I should note that um, Phil Zelikow's counselor was, was, knew that the Supreme Court was about to hand down its decision. He and Secretary of State Condi Rice were in Russia in the Kremlin at a state dinner, and Zelikow had given orders to the embassy to notify them whenever the Supreme Court handed down its decision. So in the middle of the state dinner in the Kremlin, Zelikow gets delivered the, the full text of the Supreme Court Hamden decision. He's reading it under the table. So he's, he's, he's in, the, in, the, in the dinner in the Kremlin, and he's reading page after page after page. He comes to the end, and he signals to Condi to m m meet him outside in the corridor. So the two of them are in a corridor in the Kremlin, and Philip Zelikow is briefing the Secretary of State, and the point of his remarks is, the Supreme Court has found that Geneva applies. Any participation that you and I have or anybody else has now in the brutalization of detainees could constitute a, a criminal act. Just imagine the Secretary of State and the Counselor coming to this realization in the Kremlin. It's one of, the, one of those historical vignettes uh, that every government uh, you know, experiences one point or another that I, that I find just absolutely fascinating. 
What's the third reason? The third, the third reason that underlay the use of cruelty was that uh, even if law prohibiting torture did exist, the president's constitutional commander and chief authorities included the unabridged discretion to order torture and other forms of abuse. Thus, any existing or proposed law or treaty that would purport to limit this discretion would be an unconstitutional limitation of the president's powers. Now, this position is utterly false as well. No person, including the president, is above the law. The constitutional limitations on the commander-in-chief authorities are well established and have been long established, and as evidence, for example, in the Supreme Court's 1952 Youngstown Sheet and Tube decision, which invalidated President Truman's seizure of steel mills during the Korean War. By the way, these cases were never ever cited in John Yu's torture memoranda or the other memoranda generated by the Office of Legal Counsel and the Department of Justice. So when I first read those memorandum in the course of the working group deliberations and met with John Yu, it was extraordinarily shocking to see that the most sophisticated legal unit in the US government had failed to even cite the most elementary um, uh, precedent on this case. As many legal commentators have mentioned, the failure of the Office of Legal Counsel to do this would have, would have caused any professor to flunk any constitutional law one student in any exam in any law school in the country. Yet this analysis was not provided uh, in, in, in the legal uh, or, uh, uh, paperwork that supported the uh, enhanced interrogation decision. So that was number three. No, number four, the use of cruelty in the interrogation of detainees held abroad would not implicate or adversely affect our values, our domestic legal order, our international relations, or our security strategy. This constituted a major miscalculation by the Bush administration, but the truth is that the administration appears, as I mentioned, never to have uh, uh, conducted a full-scale policy review of this matter. And in fact, the adverse consequences of this decision were absolutely massive, as I'll, I'll describe in, in some, a little bit of detail in a, in a moment. The fifth assumption was that if the abuse conducted by the United States were discovered or disclosed, virtually nobody in the United States would care. In fact, this is what NCIS first, before coming to me, NCIS went to the Department of Defense Office of Legal Counsel and the, an attorney there said, look, the decision's taken, and by the way, what's the problem here? If this were to be found, nobody would care. Um, now, I, I, I always thought that American citizens would be uh, in front of the White House with pitchforks if a single person would be abused at the hands of American captives. That was a, a naive miscalculation on my part. Uh, the truth is that many Americans truly didn't care that we abused detainees, but the truth is also that many Americans do care uh, that whether or not we apply cruelty to detainees. And then the sixth and last uh, assumption that underlie the, 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 the adoption of cruelty, and that is this. Uh, if the abuse were discovered, no one responsible would be held accountable. Uh, those of you who were students of this decision will know that um, at the same time that the Office of Legal Counsel was creating the uh, legal authority to conduct or apply these interrogation techniques, they were also crafting a very sophisticated um, anti-accountability strategy that, um, that was deployed contemporaneously with, with the authorization to use torture. And now they, the legal justification for the use of torture was, um, was pretextual. Um, this was invented legal analysis, made to look like legal analysis. But the, um, the anti-accountability strategy was extraordinarily effective and continues to be effective to this, to this day. Um, so we have six assumptions, five of which are true. Um, the sixth, uh, rather, six, five of them are, are false. The assumptions, five, and the sixth, assum the, the sixth assumption that there would be no accountability may be true. Uh, and that, that is where the legal issue continues to be uh, to this day in the United States. Um, now, let me, let me do a couple more things uh, here. Uh, I'm at risk of going too long. I could speak for hours, and I do, because I teach a full course on this, this issue, a full semester course. Uh, so let, let's turn to the issue of policy. Um, many Americans are less concerned by law and morality than what could make them safer. This is just the truth about public reaction in the United States. If torture can make them safer, these people ask, why should the law prohibit torture? Why should we not disregard the law? Uh, they've heard the repeated claims of 
Vice President Cheney and some of the other architects of the Bush era torture policy and now the similar claims of President Trump. That torture is effective and helps keep the country safe. And these people now ask, as they have a right to, why not torture? And they're entitled to an answer. Um, and here it is. We don't torture on moral, legal, and policy grounds. We don't torture because we are Americans and torture is antithetical to our commitment to human dignity and it is illegal. Beyond that, we don't torture because the evidence shows that torture is not effective, because it makes us weaker, not stronger, it makes us less safe, and because it is contrary to our strategic interest. The application of cruelty and torture harmed and continues to harm our nation's legal, foreign policy, and national security interests in multiple ways, and I'll just cite a few examples uh, to substantiate this, this assertion. First of all, the legal harm. That's where the first harm lies, and the acceptance of cruelty is contrary to and damages our laws and values and legal system by discarding the basic principle that the highest purpose of law is to protect human dignity. As Professor Lou Hankin wrote, quote, every man and woman between birth and death counts and has a claim to the irreducible core of integrity and dignity, unquote. Cruelty damages, it would ultimately transform our constitutional structure because cruelty is incompatible with the philosophical premises upon which the, upon which the Constitution is based. Our founders drafted the Constitution inspired by the belief that the law could not create but only recognize certain inalienable rights, rights vested in every person, not just citizens and not just in the United States, but, but everywhere. And these rights are the shields that in fact protect core human dignity. To have adopted and applied a policy of cruelty anywhere within the world was to say that our founders and the successor generations were wrong about their belief in the rights of the individual because there is no right more fundamental than the right to be free from cruel and inhumane treatment. If the United States could abuse Katani the way we abused him, however reprehensible their acts may have been, it is because they did not have the inalienable right to be free from cruelty. And if that is the case, then the foundation upon which our own rights rest starts to crumble because it would then be ultimately left to the discretion of the state whether and how much cruelty may be applied to each of, each of us or any, any person. The infliction of cruelty damages not only the persons or the victims but also the fabric of the law itself in two ways. It does so first because of cruelty taken out of the law's ambit and placed within the realm of policy, then the scope of the law then is by definition diminished. And also, cruelty violates the important, important principle of law that Professor Jeremy Waldron terms the principle of non-brutality. Uh, by the way, Waldron is my favorite legal professor, so I recommend him to, to all of you who have not had the pleasure of reading Waldron on, on these issues. So Waldron writes, quote, law is not savage. Law does not rule through abject fear and terror or by breaking the will of those whom it confronts. There is an enduring connection between the spirit of the law and respect for human dignity. Respect for human dig dignity, even in extremists, where law is at its most forceful and its subjects at their most vulnerable. The rule against torture is vividly emblematic of our determination to sever the link between law and brutality, between law and terror, and between law and the enterprise of breaking a person's will." End quote. That's the legal damage. Now, the, the damage to our foreign policy interests. This, by the way, now, the foreign policy interests is what up. Myself and the colleagues at Carr Center at Harvard are, are researching. This has been what we've been looking at for the last year and a half. The second category of harm from torture is to our foreign policy uh, interests. And some, the effects and consequences of our cruelty, policy of cruelty, were contrary to our long-term and overarching strategic foreign policy interests, including many of the principal institution alliances, rules that we have nurtured and fought for over the last 60 years. America's international standing and influence stems in no small measure from the effectiveness of a foreign policy that has harmonized our policy ends and means with our national values. The employment of cruelty not only betrayed our values, thus diminishing the strength of our example and our appeal to others, it impaired our foreign policy by adopting means inimical to our traditional national objective of enhancing our security through the spread of human rights protected by the rule of law. From World War II until today, American foreign policy has been grounded in strong measure on our human rights strategy. We have fought tyranny and promoted democracy not only or even primarily because it was the right thing to do, but because the spread of democracy made us safer 
and protected our freedoms in ways that echoed the deployment or development of our own domestic legal system, we successfully promoted the development of a rules-based international order based on the rule of law. Across the world, human rights principles, international treaties and laws, and particularly humanitarian and international criminal law, and many domestic constitutions and legal systems owe their character, acceptance, and relevance to the United States' inspiration, effort, and support. Let's look at three examples out of many that the, of these foreign policy achievements. The first are the Geneva Conventions. The conventions, as do most of the major human rights treaties adopted and ratified by the United States during the last century, forbid the application of cruel and inhuman and degrading treatment to all captives. And because of this, thousands of American captives uh, and soldiers have benefited from these, from these prohibitions. The Nuremberg Trials, as another example, it was a triumph of American justice and statesmanship that launched the modern era of human rights and international criminal law, treated prisoner abuse as an indictable crime, helped cement the principle of command responsibility, and started the process whereby national sovereignty no longer served as a potential and absolute shield to protect the perpetrator of crimes against humanity from the long arm of justice. And lastly, let's cite the German Constitution, or the German Basic Law. That instrument has helped transform a country that was largely responsible for launching two of the most destructive wars in the 20th century into the respectable society that it is today. It's Article 1, Section 1 states, quote, the dignity of man is inviolable. To respect and protect it is a duty of all state authority, unquote. That this should be an element of the German Constitution today, of course, reflects credit only on the German nation and its, and, and its citizens. However, the fact that it should have been adopted by Germany in 1949, the year when the Constitution was first ratified, also reflects credit on American foreign policy that it integrated our national focus on human dignity as an operational foreign policy objective. Each of these three achievements has returned massive dividends to the United States nations, to the United States. We are all the better for them. And however imperfectly these precedents, rules of law may have been observed or enforced, they have helped shape public opinion worldwide, created global standards of conduct, and influenced the, the conduct of foreign individuals, groups, and nations in ways that are overwhelmingly supportive of the US national interests and objectives. When we adopted a policy of cruelty, we sabotaged these policies and achievements. Consider these, these examples. When we tortured, we rendered incoherent a core element of our foreign policy the protection of human dignity through the rule of law. We violated the letter and spirit of the Geneva Conventions. We weakened the Nuremberg principles of command responsibility. We damaged the very fabric of human rights and international law and fostered a spirit of noncompliance with both. We fostered the incidents of prisoner abuse around the world. We created a deep legal and political fissure between ourselves and our traditional allies. And we fueled public disrespect and opposition to our country around the world is hampering the achievement of our foreign policy objectives and compromising our ability to provide human rights leadership. None of this is to our benefit, yet all of these were among the harms that the United States experienced and which we suffered when we adopted our policy of cruelty and transformed our foreign policy into incoherency. Lastly, there's a the harm to US national security. Let me now turn to this third category of harm. Uh, simply, simply stated, the use of torture is the quintessential example of allowing tactical consideration to override strategic calculations and objectives. Our nation's defenses were materially and demonstrably weakened, not strengthened by the practice of torture. Not only did it blunt our moral authority, it sabotaged our ability to build and maintain the broad alliances needed to protect the war on terror effectively. It diminished our military's operational effectiveness. It had adverse consequences on the battlefield, and it presented our enemies with a strategic gift. In the fight against terror, US national security is achieved not solely through military action, but also through the simultaneous use of ideas and communications, political persuasion, intelligence and law enforcement, and diplomacy. The attacks on the World Trade Center, the Madrid Railway Station, Charlie Hebdo, and many, many others reflect a terrorist ideology that would obliterate human dignity. Our defense to this threat cannot be solely military. These threats, or these terrorist acts, also emanated from specific ideas that fostered and propagated the cycle of hate, ideas that must be combated by our own ideas and ideals. 
Our defense must also consist of rallying to the cause in our mutual defense, those who share our values and our vision for our humane civilization. The fight against terror is not a fight that the United States can fight and win alone. Our political and military strategy must be geared to building a large uh, and sustained unified alliance that cooperates across the spectrum of the conflict. Yet we will not be able to build the alliance unless we uh, are able to articulate a clear set of political objectives and to prosecute the war using means consistent with those objectives. We will not be able to build the alliance uh, unless we constru construct with our leading allies a common legal architecture that is true to our shared values and we will not be able to establish that common legal architecture if we were to insist, as we once did, on the discretionary right to apply cruelty to detainees. When the U.S. adopted a policy of cruelty, we compromised our ability to accomplish these national security objectives. And here are four examples of strategic damage to, to the U.S. national security. First, because the use of uh, uh, the cruel treatment of prisoners constitute a criminal act in every European jurisdiction, including Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, of course, European cooperation with the United States across the spectrum of activity, including military intelligence and law enforcement, diminished once this practice of torture became apparent. Second, Almost every European politician who sought to ally with the United States uh, in, the, in the fight against terror incurred a political penalty as a consequence, as uh, is demonstrated by the political difficulties of former Prime Ministers Tony Blair and Jose Maria Aznar. Third, our abuses of Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, and elsewhere perversely generated sympathy for the terrorists and eroded the international goodwill and political support that we had enjoyed after September 11th. And fourth, we lost the the ability to draw the sharpest possible distinction between our adversaries and ourselves and to contrast our two antithetical set of ideals. By doing so, we compromise our ability to prosecute the war on terror uh, in this aspect of the war, the war of ideas, from a position of full moral authority. All of these factors contributed to the difficulties the United States has experienced in forging the strongest possible alliance uh, in the war on terror. But the damage to our national security also took place not only at the strategic level, but also at the operational and tactical military levels. And so consider these four points. First, senior U.S. military officers uh, maintained that the first and second identifiable causes of U.S. combat deaths in Iraq were respectively Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo. Um, because the effectiveness of these, these two symbols as a uh, recruiting um, vehicle for the enlistment of uh, individuals into the fight against American forces in Iraq. And you can find that, by the way, in WikiLeaks. Uh, there's a cable, 2005 cable, that reflects a three-day uh, senior meeting, which included General McChrystal and others, to discuss the strategy. And this is the first conclusion that the uh, participants in that conference reported out uh, from, their, from their meeting. Second, at various different points, some allied nations, including New Zealand, refused to participate in combat operations with the United States out of fear that in the process, enemy combatants captured by their forces might be abused by U.S. or other forces. Third, at other times, allied nations refused to train with us in joint detainee capture and handling operations, also because of concerns about U.S. abusive practices. And lastly, our policy of treating detainees harshly on the battlefield could have stiffened our adversaries resolve on the battlefield by inducing them to fight harder rather than surrender and this too could have led to the, to the uh, loss of American lives. By the way, the logic of Geneva militarily is that not only do you expect or hope to get reciprocal treatment, but if the en enemy understands that if captured, uh, they're gonna be treated humanely, they're more likely to surrender than, than not. This is one of the principal reasons why the US military hated the abandonment of Geneva and lobbied hard within the administration to return to the G Geneva standard. Now, um, let me bring this to a close, but let me just mention a couple of things about Canada. Um, um, and actually, I, I and my colleagues at, at Harvard would like to understand better the U.S. bilateral relationship as it was affected by torture. And as I've discussed with Margaret, we hope to come back and, and um, research this in greater depth and would welcome any assistance that any of you could give us in understanding this, this um, dynamic better. But let me mention some things that we do know about how U.S. torture affected Canada and affected the U.S. bilateral relationship. Now, um, uh, obviously we have a very strong relationship. It's, a, it's one of the closest set of bilateral relationships in the, in, the, in the world. But the U.S. decisions, of course, strained that relationship, compromised it in some important ways. Uh, the detention of Omar Khadr, of course, the 15-year-old Canadian citizen in Guantanamo, 
was a, a, a flashpoint more than an irritant in, in uh, Canadian opinion towards the United States. Then, of course, then the, the abduction of uh, Maher Arar, another Canadian citizen, and his rendition to Syria for torture then became a cause celeb in, in Canada and became a, uh, an object of not only major embarrassment but an obstacle to deeper relationships. Now, Canada, to its credit, did a number of things as well. Canada refused to turn over prisoners to the United States and Iraq out of fear that the United States would abuse them. So what this also meant was a, a separation uh, of military forces in the battlefield in ways that could not have been good to the alliance. Uh, how that may have affected tactical combat operations is a matter that is not yet understood uh, fully, but it had to have uh, some some consequences. But let me mention what is, I think, the most tantalizing bit of evidence about where Canada stood on, on this issue. Uh, I happen to have been the senior U.S. official at an uh, international military law conference in Singapore in 2005. And at one point of the conference, I was literally surrounded by the chief military lawyers in uniform of Canada, uh, United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand. And the four of them told me that what I needed to understand as a senior American at the conference was that their country's cooperation with the, with the United States across the range of uh, activities in the war on terror in the fields of intelligence, and military cooperation, and law enforcement would continue to decline if the United States persisted in abusing detainees uh, the way we were abusing them. And when I, I was stunned by this because I had been involved in the Guantanamo matter that I had Described, so I knew that we were guilty to an effect, but I, I didn't know about the rest of this. I wasn't aware about broader American abusive. So I agree with them entirely. If we were doing this, and ex exactly this is the kind of message, um, I couldn't respond to them. I couldn't divulge what I knew I didn't know, but the message that these four countries had coordinated in coordinated fashion sent me this particular message was, of course, not something that these four individuals undertook on their own. This was a coordinated message that was approved undoubtedly at the highest levels of governments and then directed uh, to be delivered uh, to me in that, in that particular conference. By the way, um, the, the damage with the U.S.-U.K. bilateral relationship was massive, as our research has found, uh, in, in particularly in the intelligence field. Um, British provision of intelligence to the United States was reduced dramatically as a result of the British understanding better the extent of American torture policies. New Zealand pulled its SAS formations out of combat in, in, uh, in Afghanistan because the New Zealand Prime Minister concluded that he could no longer um, uh, take the risk that the, that the integrity of this premier military formation might be compromised uh, by close contact with American special forces units that were that were using torture on a routine basis. So um, this this is the subject of our publication or research, and we found many examples of significant military intelligence and and political damage along these lines. But because this is in the realm of classified information, high level state to state discussions, almost all of this information is is still contained in classified archives or in the memories of those officials who participated in them. The good news is that the, the pushback by allied nations was, was, was massive and significant and effective, even though, of course, it did not succeed in, in completely uh, turning U.S. policy around uh, rapidly. Um, so let me, let me close this discussion. I've gone on much too long. I tend to do that in, the, in these kinds of things. But let me, let me quote John McCain, our senator, who's been a, a one-man force against torture in the U.S. Congress during all these years. And... Um, uh, Senator McCain gave a speech on December 9th, 2014, uh, reflecting on torture and what it means to be an American, and he said the following, and I'll, I'll quote him at length, but I'll close with, with this uh, quote. So he says, quote, in the end, torture's failure to serve its intended purpose isn't the main reason to oppose its use. I have often said and will always maintain that this question isn't about our enemies, it's about us. It's about who we were, who we are, and who we aspire to be. It's about how we represent ourselves to the world. We have made our way in this often dangerous and cruel world, not by just strictly pursuing our geopolitical interests, but by exemplifying our political values and influencing other nations to embrace them. When we fight to defend our security, we fight also for an idea, not for a tribe or a twisted interpretation of an ancient religion or for a king, but for an idea that all men are endowed by their creator with inalienable rights 
how much safer the world would be if all nations believe the same, how much more dangerous it can become when we forget it ourselves even momentarily. Our enemies act without conscience, we must not. Acting without conscience isn't necessary. It, is, it isn't even helpful. Um, and he continues. Now let us reassert the contrary proposition that it is essential to our success in this war that we ask those who fight for it to remember at all times that they are defending a sacred ideal of how nations should be governed and conduct their relations with others, even our enemies. Those of us who give them this duty are obliged by history, by our nation's highest ideals and the many terrible sacrifices made to protect them, by our respect for human dignity, to make clear that we need not risk our national honor to prevail in this or any war. We need only remember in the worst of times, through the chaos and terror of war, when facing cruelty, suffering and loss, that we are always Americans and different, stronger, and better than those who would destroy us." End quote. Thank you all for being here tonight. fascinating uh, presentation and you invited us to give you suggestions on how we Canadians handle such issues and I entirely get that this was done in the theater of war and there were terrorist issues very present but may I suggest that if you ever want to see the perfection of interrogation um, we had in Canada a very uh, senior, one of the most decorated officers, a general, who his name is Russell Williams, and he turned out to also be a serial killer. And this guy went undetected for quite some time and savagely murdered many, many women. And there are tremendously educational uh, videotapes of the police person, the man, who interrogated him, the subtlety, the brilliance, he got Williams to spill his guts. It's incredible to watch. So you can probably get it if you look at CBC uh, archives and as a, as a professor, you, I mean you have to show some video in class at some time. But this interrogation is, is exactly what you're talking about in terms of its effectiveness because Williams also was so brilliant, as well as to look at the guy, you're not ever going to think that this guy is a serial killer. Uh, however, this policeman did it in such an effective way, I, I highly recommend that you, you have a look at it. Great, thank you for the, for the recommendation. Thank you, Laura. Um, next, we'll have Sven Yershevsky, Phil uh, over there, and uh, right here, Sven. One of the things that struck me was that you never mentioned that war is a political act. It was simply a military act, and that is one of the great failures of the war on terrorism, that the political dimension was never addressed, hence some of these issues. In 2005, I was stationed in Croatia, and amongst my uh, duties was to encourage the Croats and certain individuals to give themselves up for trial in the ICTY. Um, I had a... Uh, sort of a Friday night a meeting with senior politicians, including the former prime minister. You can do these things in small countries. And uh, on one of these meetings, just after Abu Ghraib came out, 
<clears throat> what was at stake at that point was Ante Gotovina, which raises moral issues of another kind that I'd be happy to discuss with you separately. And he throws a picture at me and says, after this, and he showed a picture of the guy who looked like a Christmas tree, why should we give up anyone? And that's a very concrete example of a failure that resulted precisely from US torture. I had a hell of a time after that. Um, given that the US has not wiped the slate clean, clean I want to ask an advocatus diaboli question. Given, and things like this happened, and that the principle of command responsibility was not implied, how can the US still, without charges of, of damaging charges of hypocrisy, persist with a policy, a foreign policy based on values? How? I think it's very hard for the United States to do that. In fact, uh, the, you know, we didn't, there are lots of issues we didn't get to discuss a lot, but the American failure of accountability continues to compromise our, our credibility and our, our, and our ability to lead uh, credibly on uh, human rights and international legal issues and on many other uh, issues around the world. Um, I had a senior civilian official who worked with AFRICOM, works with AFRICOM, she's still uh, there, who um, was there before and after 9-11, um, before and after Abu Ghraib, and she said, before Abu Ghraib, we had complete uh, credibility with each of the 49 uh, uh, African nation militaries. After Abu Ghraib and the failure of accountability, we have zero credibility with any one of them. We simply can't discuss with them any longer issues of law of war and why soldiers should be uh, subordinate to, to those laws and should hold soldiers accountable for violating them. Um, so there's a, there's a massive loss of credibility. And in international meetings on human rights, the, the Indians and the Russians and the Chinese uh, repeatedly taunt the Americans, like, what, what are you, you know, you, you're going to lecture us on human rights? It, it's, it's, it's a standard response now in many human rights conversations. And there's really not a good answer to that, which is why accountability continues to be a, um, a very life issue, even though most, America, most Americans don't understand it to be one, don't think there should be any accountability. And even within the, um, the government, um, there's a desire, like with Barack Obama, unfortunately. Uh, Barack Obama, for all his moral acuity and his intelligence, um, when he said that we need to look forward, not backwards, uh, as if uh, accountability for criminal acts is not always a backward-looking exercise. Um, uh, he failed to understand the, the continuing damage that lack of accountability would, would uh, cause to the United States. So I see this as a very much an unsettled issue, and I think we will not regain that credibility until we, we address it in some credible way. Phil Gursky and then Ken Watson. Thank you, Mr. Moore, for a fascinating talk. Thanks for coming up with a lot of water to give it. Thank uh, you. I have another question, sir. Uh, you know, President, uh, who may or may not last for a full four year term, uh, has heard me correct, brag during the, the campaign, but not only with waterboarding, you do it a lot worse than your president. Yes. Will you be here, sir, in four years to talk about torture on the Trump administration? <laughs> um, well, you know, as I, as I mentioned, my view is that Trump's going to try to implement this at some point. It's going to be harder for him, and the military is poised to resist. So, um, and I know this because I've been in contact with many of the military officials, and all the research I've done, by the way, has been in conjunction with West Point. West Point has been our full partner in having holding two conferences one on the, the tactical consequences of the U.S. use of torture, and the second on the strategic consequences of the U.S. Uh, use of torture. And just two weeks ago, we had, um, I moderated a, a, a half-day discussion at Harvard with the superintendents of the three major military academies at Harvard talking about values in the military profession and um, human rights in, in, uh, in our national security strategy. So the military will, will tell Trump from the first moment, they were poised to do this immediately after inauguration, that if he were to order them to reinstate waterboarding and other tortures, they would consider that to be an unlawful order and they would refuse to obey it. Now, I have less confidence in the CIA. Uh, the, the CIA deputy director appointed by Trump is a proud veteran of CIA black sites. And the, the CIA agents who implemented, uh, constructed, um, um, uh, and staff the, the enhanced interrogation program were promoted, honored, and are maintained. They suffered no career damage whatsoever within the CIA. So uh, given that lack of leadership and lack of uh, kind of restructuring, I think the CIA must be considered to be a, a, a tool that a President Trump could, 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 could use again. Now, the law is stronger. Uh, there are m uh, many other barriers against the use of this. 
but which is not to say that Trump would not try to secretly uh, order Mike Pompeo and others to uh, return to rendition and other kinds of other kinds of practices. Sobering, Ken. Mr. Morrow, thank you for a fine, uh, for a fine and useful talk. <clears throat> I liked uh, the first part of Senator McCain's uh, quote, where he said, uh, "This is not about whether it works." I worry that uh, the more space we give to the argument that uh, the torture is is ineffective in getting yeah. information, <clears throat> the more space we give to it, more implicitly we're saying that it matters whether it's effective in getting information or not. So I, I think the, there's a kind of a subtle but important problem there. I think the second problem that's kind of related to it is that, as you said, um, a large majority of Americans don't believe that. And I doubt that they're going to be convinced any time soon. So I, I suggest that giving much space to that part of your good arguments might be counter, counter, uh, uh, counter that's a concern. effective. Mm -hmm. And that's an observation that um, I hear occasionally. Um, but here's, here's a response. Uh, some of the anecdotes that I, I mentioned here uh, about um, Australian Navy refusing to train with the American Navy or Canadians refusing to turn over prisoners to the United States. And, uh, people, officers used to come to me after, uh, after Abu Ghraib with these kinds of stories. And after a while, what I did was understanding that there was a policy dimension to the torture argument that had not been discussed or analyzed, or so to my knowledge. I prepared a memorandum called The Policy Consequences of Legal Decisions in the War on Terror. And what the argument argued was that these are not only legal questions. Guantanamo is not only legal. Military commissions aren't legal. Interrogation is not really legal, but the important legal dimensions. But there's a policy dimension which is massive. It was badly understood. And the policy analysis would indicate massive damage to American core national interest if we were to gather these things. Um, uh, the, the, the Pentagon has a, uh, every four years, they have a, the apex long-range planning exercise is called the Quadrennial Defense Review. And I submitted my memorandum to this group and they decided the career military that this was a phenomenon that had to be understood in one of the baskets. And they were, were already gathering data when uh, Secretary Rumsfeld's team and the Office of the Secretary found out that they were doing so in order them to stop. Um, which to me, and this is kind of akin to what actually happened at CIA where CIA ordered the Intelligence Science Board not to conduct scientific research into the scientific basis for enhanced interrogation because he didn't want to hear, didn't want to learn what the data uh, showed. So as long as Tenet was secretary, he, he blocked that, it, that, um, that scientific investigation. And when it finally was done three years later, it showed that there was no scientific basis to interrogation. So two points. We need to understand the policy. At the heart, I agree with you. The basis, uh, the objection to, to cruelty and torture is inherently moral. But there's also a policy dimension that needs to be understood. And that policy data uh, responds directly to the concerns of those individuals who don't care at all about the morality of torture, don't care at all about the illegality of, of torture. They're only interested in whether torture can make them safer. This is the Donald Trump mentality. And I think that. Um, um, the arguments against torture are both are, are, are legal, moral, and, and, and policy. And, and the most effective argument is deploying all three of them, not just limiting it to, to one or the other. Um, having said all of that, I'll, I'll be the first to confess to you that despite teaching this issue and researching it for like three years now full time, I don't have a, an elevator story. You know, I don't, I, I'm incapable of reducing this to a sound bite that would be effective to a drunk in a bar. You know, it's, um, uh, so if, if you have ideas, um, th there's the academic side to this, there's a legal side to this, there's a policy side to this, and there's a political side to this. And um, my view is that most of the issue now is in the political sphere. The fact that the Republican Party is almost uh, objectively a pro-torture party is a national tragedy. The fact that the issue of torture has been politicized, where Democrats and Republicans are opposite sides of the issue, um, is, is a national tragedy. American support for torture was high after 9-11, but it skyrocketed from around 45% to 
to where it is now, 60 plus percent, after Obama um, prohibited the use of torture, and then Dick Cheney went out and gave a very eloquent American Enterprise speech accusing the president of being weak on, on torture, and the Republican Party adopted interrogation as part of their political platform. When that happened, and you can trace this, polling firms have, have done this, Republican support for torture skyrocketed to more than 80%. And, st and, and nationally, the support for torture stayed high because the Republican Party kept making Obama, opposition to Obama and, and Obama's policies, including the opposition to torture, as part of their political platform. We need to be able to operate in this political sphere and, and uh, gathering data to decision makers is my chosen way of trying to reverse this kind of belief in political uh, con situation that exists in our country. If that somewhat asks your, answers your question. A final question. Um, just by way of information, when you do your information search, on, in Canada, you mentioned that Canada refused to release to the United States, but it did release to Afghanistan. And it was, there was a whole scandal in Canada about that. And by the way, this is a dilemma. Uh, because this is a dilemma, because I would talk to American JAGs who, uh, in fact, at West Point in, in a, a, a military bases, who would talk about putting together like 80 page briefs documenting the crimes that an individual Afghan had committed, and then taking the prisoner with this evidentiary compilation to their Afghan counterparts. The Afghan military would take person in custody, take a look at the document and throw that in the garbage can. They would ask the person, what, what tribe are you, what sector are you? And the answer to that question would depend upon whether they'd be treated cruelly or with, with some measure of respect. They were unable to, um, to significantly model, as far as I know, I don't, I don't have the actual date on this, but uh, Afghan cruelty internally was, I think, largely untouched by American efforts during this entire war. So we, we tell the American forces and we enforce the, the, the prohibition against treating people cruelly, but American forces cannot maintain custody of everybody in the Afghan theater, theater of operations. So what do you do in that kind of situation? And I, I don't know the answer to that question. But my real question was the following. You referred to a legal memo uh, critiqued it, but there, I was at Harvard and Alan Dershowitz, a professor, of law advocated for torture. Yes. So I wonder if, if he had an input into um, you know, your, your story. Uh, we, I, we, I've, I've thought about inviting Alan, and, and I don't know him personally, um, to our class to justify uh, you know, his position. I, have, I just don't have a desire to hear his pro-torture arguments. He'll tell you, and he, his writing is that I don't believe in torture, but I recognize the, uh, we, we, we almost recognize the reality that it will take place. And it's better under this, this situation to seek to modulate the use of torture and reduce its ultimate use rather than to uh, allow it to be conducted in, in the shadows in an unregulated fashion. I think it's a false argument. I think it's specious. Uh, it assumes facts, not in evidence and, and unprovable. Uh, and it's um, so deeply disgraceful for a Harvard president to be essentially conveying a pro-torture argument. I, difficult to try to engage him. I'd now like to invite the amazing Alex Neve uh, to offer concluding remarks. And we're very grateful to Alex because he's here straight off a plane from Vancouver. <laughs> very demanding day tomorrow. And thank you so much. And let me slip in a final word of thanks as well to John Packer, his amazing staff, Caroline and others, and my colleagues, uh, Lou Auerbach, John, Larry, and others who have helped make tonight possible. Alex. Great. Uh, thanks so much, uh, uh, Margaret, and uh, great to see everyone out uh, this evening. Uh, and, and what an honor uh, for me to be able to firstly express on all of our behalf uh, tremendous thanks, deep appreciation, uh, and I think uh, most importantly, uh, very heartfelt respect, uh, Alberto, for, uh, for what you've shared with us tonight and, and for your journey against torture over these past many years. Um, and uh, I guess I want to begin 
with the thanks for, for what you've shared this evening. Um, uh, I, I just jotted down a few adjectives that were coming fast and furious to me as I, as I listened to you. Clearly, that was a, a wonderfully illuminating and informative uh, speech. Uh, it was gripping. It was a gripping account. As you were taking us through those meetings and you about to lunge across the desk, and I felt like I was there and watching it. So I hope there's a book and a movie uh, eventually to come. Uh, certainly a very eloquent uh, expose. I mean, there was nothing, it, it, you were so... Um, factual uh, and precise and measured as you took us uh, through those various steps. And that, that's just such a powerful way to, to bring an issue like this to an audience. Uh, no doubt you make a passionate case uh, against torture uh, in, in, in so many ways. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and, and clearly a very convincing indictment of of the ways in which uh, torture crept in, was, was, uh, was legalized uh, during those uh, very troubling years uh, under President Bush. Um, so thank you very much for that. I also do want to, though, just very, uh, very meaningfully express thanks and appreciation for you, <laughs> for, uh, for who you are, uh, for, for what you stand for. Um, you know, as I, as I listen to that account and, and think of the, the difficult encounters and exchanges and where you were <laughs> as you were doing that work, uh, I just have such uh, incredible uh, respect for a man who was obviously uh, a man of integrity and clarity and determination and uh, how fortunate we are to, to know such a colleague, so, so thank you very much for that. Um, you've taken us back uh, 10, 12, 15 years, um, and then brought us forward. Uh, and, um, I, and it's of course always, you know, any human rights organization always says it is so important to know and confront and address and deal with uh, the past. Uh, so it's, it's so very important uh, that you're able to do so and were able to do, did do so tonight and are continuing to do so through your work. Of course, very importantly though, you've reminded us uh, and, and, and people were responding to this in the questions as well, that by no means is this just about the past uh, and you know, history has come around once again and here we have a president who I think it's safe to say not only would be willing to tolerate or support torture, but, but is just kind of waiting to be unleashed to become a passionate champion uh, of torture, which is, of course, deeply troubling. Um, and, and thus, your account uh, is, is so relevant and so important uh, to be hearing today because you've, 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 you've revealed to us how in a country like the United States, with and, 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 and your remarks were peppered with references to the Constitution and laws and checks and balances and the multitude of offices and counsel, etc., who surely should have been able to stamp this out before it was even more than a mere whisper. Uh, and you've showed us how readily uh, and insidiously that was not the case. And, and thus with a commander-in-chief willing to be a champion-in-chief of torture, uh, we have to be very worried about how that could once again be the case. Uh, your remarks have obviously focused on the United States. Um, I think it's important, of course, for us to, to remember that uh, the torture, the scourge of torture, the terror of torture um, is, is so very global, uh, as we all know that. Amnesty International just recently wrapped up. Uh, we had a major two-year global campaign against torture. Sadly, it's one of these issues that we have to come back to <laughs> quite frequently. It seems every decade uh, we have to devote a couple of years to a very concerted campaign against torture. And the stats as we launched that campaign have always stuck with me. Um, as we launched the campaign, we told the world torture was happening in 150 countries. You know, do the math. That's, that's just over three quarters of the world's states uh, 
today. I mean, this wasn't the 1984 campaign or the 1969 campaign. This was our most recent campaign that in half of those countries, torture was widespread and systematic. You know, not just some occasional aberrant rogue instances, but systematic and widespread. That's about 75 of the world states. And that in 50 countries, we documented the torture of children. Uh, so obviously still a very harrowing human rights reality uh, that needs uh, champions uh, such as Alberto. And of course, today we need go no further than Syria. Uh, Amnesty a couple of months ago put out what, and, and I, I, you know, after my many years of, of work, I, I always find it amazing that there's still reports that come along that can kind of take me down to a even grimmer and more harrowing level. And the most recent report we had on torture in Syria uh, absolutely was the case. And now, of course, we have the U.S. revelations that crematoriums are now being used to to cover up the the deaths uh, from torture in Sednaya prison. Um, well, what about us? Canada and where we fit uh, in all of this. Uh, you you, you uh, took us to a couple of places at the end, but I want to actually remind us all that there's, there's, there's a not insignificant anti-torture agenda that we actually need to be very cognizant of and I think more active around uh, in Canada. Uh, certainly one piece of it, it is some of the notorious individual cases. You reminded us of, of both Omar Khadr uh, and Meher Arar. There are others uh, who have uh, who have suffered the, the terrible consequences of torture abroad, generally in national security cases, and, and in a number of those instances, uh, Canada's hands are not clean. Uh, there is, it's, there, there's been two judicial inquiries, Meher Arar's case and then a, another conducted by former Supreme Court of Canada Justice Frank Iacobucci that have made that very clear. It's not that the Canadian government was doing its best uh, to try to hold back the abuses being unleashed by American action or Syrian action or Egyptian action, but uh, we very much know there's complicity. And yes, we've had some accountability around that, but we've still got far to go. Omar Khadr hasn't had his accountability, for instance. That's yet to come. Uh, we also need to remind ourselves that we have, there's policy, there's laws, there's guidelines uh, that exist in Canada that that allow torture, uh, that, that turn a blind eye to torture. Uh, we have uh, infamous ministerial guidelines that govern how the issue of torture should be handled in our intelligence relationships, including with the United States, um, and sadly do not take a clear absolute position that if torture arises, say no to it, turn away from it, reject the intelligence, uh, but make it very clear both with outgoing intelligence and incoming intelligence that yes, the general rule is if torture's a concern, walk away, but exceptional circumstances, uh, if you get enough approval higher up the chain, uh, it's okay. Uh, well, any of us who know the law on, uh, on torture internationally know it's never okay, and you've eloquently reminded us of that tonight, Alberto. There's no exceptionality when it comes uh, to torture, but our guidelines um, officialize that. Similarly, our Immigration Act allows deportations to torture. Again, the general rule is it shouldn't happen, but both legislation and backed up by an unfortunate Supreme Court of Canada ruling from a number of years ago, again, take this angle of, ah, but in exceptional circumstances, not defined, I guess we'll know them when we see them, but in exceptional circumstances, uh, the deportation to torture could go ahead. Practices abroad, somebody just reminded us of the Afghan prisoner uh, transfer uh, debacle, uh, which still hangs there as a stain and, and, and something we have never confronted, it's something which in the day, of course, was the biggest political scandal in the country, prorogation of parliament, ministers were falling, constitutional crisis, etc. But in the midst of that, I think it was easy to lose sight that what it was really all about was are we as Canada prepared to do everything we can and are obliged to do to ensure that we do not become complicit in torture? Uh, as we readily handed over prisoners in Afghanistan to Afghan counterparts, knowing no one can deny that the record was anything but absolutely clear that a significant number of them were almost certainly going to be tortured. 
We do need an accounting for that. We and others still say we should have a public inquiry even to better understand why that happened, but importantly, to understand what needs to be put in place to make sure that next year, five years from now, 10 years from now, the next military deployment in some similar situation, um, that is not repeated. Uh, anyway, there's, there, I think uh, there's other things I could refer to, but I just think it is really important that as we, um, as we, as we kind of um, uh, sit with, with your words and your sort of cautionary reminders to us tonight, uh, Alberto, that we, we shouldn't be too smug and complacent uh, as Canadians. Uh, it may not be to the degree of, of brutality uh, that we know uh, was part of U.S. practice uh, or the per pervasive, insidious uh, degree to which it had infiltrated across government. Um, but, um, but we've got some house cleaning we should and could be doing in Canada as well. Uh, lastly, I just want to thank you for your six points. I love them, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase them, um, because I think, you know, I, I mean, it's so, to a certain degree, it's a bit easy to kind of come up with the explanation of, you know, why does torture happen in Syria? But it is a more vexing uh, and troubling question as to how and why does torture happen as readily uh, as it did during those years in the United States. Um, and, you know, and I think you did a great idea of debunking them, but I, I love these six points. Uh, number one, you reminded us that there's that kind of fear and fury, I think is the way you described it, that unleashes it, that sets the context, and of course that is so very true. Um, but um, uh, you know, sort of these assumptions of it it, it, it does get unleashed because people believe torture works. People believe torture actually isn't banned, <laughs> even though it so clearly is. Uh, that, that people believe even if it's banned, who cares? The president can do what he wants and can override anything. That it happens because it has no impact. All of this, which is just so readily apparent, and you, you cataloged it so brilliantly, all of the ways in which it has such real impact on relationships and, and the effectiveness of counter-terrorism uh, strategies that it happens because who cares? You know, and for, I guess, organizations like Amnesty, that's the, that's the rallying call of, of, of mobilizing and educating and awareness building to, uh, to provoke that sense of caring. Um, and then the absolutely critical human rights message that is sort of relevant to torture, but so many other things, it happens because there's no consequences. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's, again, another reason why it's so important that we do, as you've helped us do tonight, continue to look back. Um, and even though it's a, obviously, a, 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 to say the least, an uphill battle, uh, we can't give up on the call to ensure that, that there are consequences, that there certainly are consequences for what you've reminded us of tonight, uh, and that going forward, uh, whenever we confront or become aware of torture, that we absolutely have to ensure that that justice and accountability agenda prevails. So thank you ever so much. Uh, fabulous evening. Um, I know you've touched all of us, both here and here, uh, as I think any good s speech against torture should, uh, and we're so very fortunate to have had you here. Thank you. Thank you.